Amen. Hey, welcome to church. My name is Andrew, and I have the amazing privilege of being the senior pastor here at Reach Church. Whether you're here joining us at our Blair campus or you're a part of our online campus, we love that you guys have chosen to make worshiping with us here at Reach Church a part of your day. And if you're new today, we especially want to welcome you and let you know that we hope that while you're here, you feel like family. And if we can serve you or help you in any way, let us know. Let me encourage you, let me invite you up front to grab your Bible and turn to the Old Testament book book of First Samuel. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, I want to invite you to raise your hand and allow one of our ushers to bring you a Bible. It's a gift. It's yours. It's yours to have and to keep. Just raise your hand. Say, hey, I'd like one. Turn to the Old Testament book of First Samuel chapter 4, and you can find that one of two ways. You can go to the very beginning of your Bible, and in the table of contents, it'll tell you the name for Samuel. It will assign a page number to it. Turn there and then flip until you find a big number four. Or start at the front of your Bible and begin working your way to the right. And after just a few books of the Bible, you will land in 1 Samuel. And today, we're picking up in a study of 1 Samuel that we've been in, but we're starting a brand new series. We're starting a brand new series today that we're calling Defeated. And we're going to be looking at defeat over the next several weeks together as a church. As a kid growing up, I was so blessed to get to play a lot of different sports. I played baseball for 11 years. I played football junior high and high school. I wrestled from junior high through college, and I loved it. But there was also this thing as a kid that I did where I would find my favorite players or my favorite position and the, posi the players that played that position, and I would begin to study how they did what they did. That in and of itself is not inherently bad. In fact, I encourage my children that are involved in any activity, whether it's sports or music or anything of its kind, to, to look at how other people do what they do, how they have honed their craft, how they have become skilled experts at what they do. But there's another thing that I still see happening on playgrounds and in gymnasiums the country over. And it's what happens not necessarily in the game, but before the game. People, kids, even adults want to emulate, they want to replicate what their favorite athlete is doing. And so they'll dress like their favorite athlete and they'll pick up on mannerisms of their favorite athlete. I've got something I want to show you today as an example. If you are a fan of basketball at all, and you have watched any basketball since the early 2000s, there's a player, number 23, who started his career with the Cleveland Cavaliers, his hometown team. And before each game, he would come out of the tunnel and would head to the scorer's table. There he would pick up a, a bottle of chalk. And in that moment, the Cleveland basketball arena would begin to build, it would begin to swell, there would be a shift, a tangible, palpable shift in momentum. People would pull out their phones and music would begin to, to increase in volume and the pressure could be felt in the arena. And this player would take the chalk and would begin to put it on his hands. And as he did, he would set the chalk back down on the scorer's table and leaning over, he would draw the attention and, and the allure of the audience, of the fan base, both in person and watching televised. And you knew in that moment as he took his hands together and he threw it up in the air that it was game time. LeBron James, want to be Michael Jordan. You don't have to be a sports fanatic to even pick up on that visual illustration. It's so synonymous with the player, with the person of number 23, LeBron James. There was actually a season in his career where when he got to Miami, he, he stopped doing that. He was surrounded by other all-star players, and, and I don't know the, the, the rationale of the reason, but he didn't do that. And do you know that he got backlash for that? There were fans the world over that were reaching out to LeBron, and especially if he was in a shooting slump or they began to lose games, and they would insist that he needed to bring back the pre-game ceremonial chalk throw, that if he would do that, they would start to win. They actually believed, they carried this superstition 
where they thought that if they did this, that somehow their team would, would play better. Now let me ask you a question. Apart from the person, what value add is there in the dust, in the chalk, in the smoke? Yet how many people, how many people actually look on and find more value in the show than in the person playing the game? And I want to contest this morning. There are far too many Christians that approach their faith this way. There are far too many Christians who care more about the religious rituals than they do an understanding of a right relationship with God. And if we're not careful, we end up worshiping the wrong thing and give ourselves over to idolatry. And we're going to see today in our study of 1 Samuel how, how easy it is to become complacent and lose sight of the person that matters most in favor of religious rituals. Well, Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for Reach Church. Thank you for your word that we absolutely believe and hold to, that is active and that it's alive, it's complete, it's entire, it's perfect. Thank you that as your word goes out, it doesn't return void. And as we lift your name up, you, you promise to draw all people unto yourself. And so, Lord, I just pray this morning that I would be conduit, that you would meet us where we're at, help us to encounter you so that our lives would change forever. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be received as a gift, holy and pleasing to you alone. God, I beg you that you would use me today in spite of me. I pray that I would preach with authenticity and with accuracy, rightly dividing your word in ways that matter and make sense. And help us, Father, help us, convict us. Each and every one of us, Holy Spirit, we invite you to work in our lives. If there are areas in our lives where we've been holding on to superstition, or we've been celebrating religious rituals and we've lost sight of you, convict us, draw us back to yourself. We give you this time, Lord, for our good and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. First Samuel chapter four, verse one. And Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. So what were Samuel's words? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's not on the screen, but it is in your Bible. First Samuel chapter three, beginning in verse 19. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. And all Israel, from Dan in the north of Beersheba in the south, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. A prophet means an ambassador, a spokesperson who is a truth teller. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, there at the tabernacle, and he gave messages to Samuel, the prophet, there at that tabernacle. And Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. Not to Eli the high priest, not to Hophni and Phinehas the priest, but to Samuel. This young boy whose life was dedicated to the service of the Lord. There, God would show up and he would give the word of the Lord as he did to Moses as a mediator between God and the Israelites. Now using this prophet, this man of God to be a truth teller and an ambassador, a spokesperson on his behalf. In verse 1 of chapter 4, the second part, at that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer and the Philistines were at Aphek. Well, there's a couple of things that we have to ask and that we can kind of assume. War was really commonplace at this time and it doesn't give us indication as to what type of war, but historically it's a territorial war. And when you look at the region and you consider the cities that are brought up, Shiloh is where the Israelites are primarily located. It's about 18 miles to Ebenezer and about 20 miles to Aphek. The Israelites are known as a mountain people. They're literally, they're, they're known as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as a mountaintop people group. They, they, they hide out in the mountains and on hilltops. The Philistines, they're considered a sea people or a coastal people. Many of them coming from Cyprus and, and Crete to the southeastern part of the Mediterranean Sea, landing there just above Egypt. 
And as they, as they make their journey, as they make their voyage from these islands and into Asia Minor, the, the, the bottom half of this, this countryside, they come as a force to be reckoned with. They're there and they are considered war bullies. They show up and they have five armies strategically placed throughout Gaza. And it's, it's growing like crazy. And as they grow, they continue to take more land for themselves. The Israelites are often in battle, but they're going to experience something that they're unfamiliar with. And I want you to pay attention to this. In verse 2, it says, The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. That's what they were unfamiliar with. They were not all too familiar, this generation, with defeat. Because God had provided blessings. He had honored his promise. They would go to war and God would give them provisions. They would lean into the Lord and he would demonstrate for them that the victory was theirs. And he would give clear mandates, guidance, instructions on how to go about the war. And he would deliver his people. So this, this defeat in this battle was something that was unique to them in this season, in this generation of people, these Israelites. Now, verse 3 leads us to this incredible historical narrative to begin asking a question that we should, really, we would do well to reflect on. Verse 3, it says that after the battle was over, after these 4,000 Israelite men were killed, the troops were cheated to their camp. They, they run back up into the hills of Ebenezer. And the elders of Israel asked this question. Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Well, there's two things that are right about this. Number one, who's asking? And number two, what they're asking. The elders of Israel are the overseers of the nation. They're the ones who are giving counsel and guidance and leadership and direction. And it's, it's, it's clear here that something or someone has failed. I was told often and early in ministry that the speed of the pack is the speed of the leader. And that a leader can't take someone that they themselves are not at or have not been. And so as leaders, we're, turn, we're, we're taught to be consummate learners, growing and applying and learning, and doing, and leading. The best leaders are also the best followers. But you've got to be intentional about who you're following and where they're leading you to. Now think about Pastor Russell's message last week, and if you didn't get a chance to watch it, I, I, I want to encourage you to go back and do so. And you think about the message the week before as we investigated the, the, the fallout of Hophni and Phinehas. And the message before that is Pastor Russ Callenhoven talked about these scoundrels and the actions that they were doing. These were the leaders of Israel at that time. And they were reckless in their behaviors. These were the people that were leading. And the elders were allowing these things to happen. So the elders are asking this question of themselves. Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? And something brilliant here that I really appreciate in this question is the sincerity of the sovereignty of God. Even in defeat, these Philistines that have defeated the Israelites have run them back up into the hill country. And, and the Israelites are asking the question about the sovereignty. Why did God allow this to happen? They didn't say that God caused it. They weren't giving God credit or blaming God for it. But they recognized that even in defeat, God is still sovereign. That's something we would do well to consider. Many of us wrestle with these battles as we face the war of life. And somehow when these things happen, we ask ourselves what we did wrong or where is God or why is God not around or what... We need to understand that even in the battle, God is still sovereign. He is still large and he is still in charge. So then the, if that's not the question, then what's the real question behind the question? And that's what the Israelites should have been wrestling with, but they skirt tail around. They don't really want to address the issue with the issue. They actually do what you and I are really good at doing. They, they look at a problem and without giving a real consideration to it, they have a presupposition about the outcome. And so they're looking to use their own metrics and their own strengths and their own experiences to mitigate the problem. They're not willing to wait on the Lord, trust in the Lord, or follow the leadership of the Lord. 
They recognize there's a problem. And so they say, all right, we're going to figure this out. We just, we just lost this battle. This is, not, this is not good. This is not normal. This isn't right. They're asking the right, the right question. Why did the Lord allow this to happen? Why did, the, why did he allow the, the, the Philistines to defeat us? But they don't wait to hear the answer. And we're going to investigate the answer here through the actions of the Israelites. Then they said, hey, guys, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. Okay, so what is the Ark of the Covenant? This is not, this is not uh, Indiana Jones. It's not the Holy Grail. It's nothing like that. So let's ask and answer the question, what is the Ark of the Covenant? There's a brilliant New Testament historical evidence of what it is. If you want, I'd encourage you to keep your finger here and turn almost all the way to the very end of your Bible, to the New Testament book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9 is where we're going to be. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9. And if you don't have time to, to get there right now, just write it down as a parallel passage. We're going to look at Hebrews 9, specifically verses 1 through 4. If you're there, say amen. If you need a minute, say I need a minute. All right, I'm giving you a minute. All right, that's about a minute. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 1. That first covenant between God and Israel had regulations. So what we know now is that this is called a conditional covenant. That God will enter into a mutual agreement between his nation, his people, the Israelites, and, and, and himself. Moses will act as the mediator, the ambassador between God and the, and the nation of Israel. And so there's this conditional covenant, the regulations of worship, and a place for worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. And in the first room, there was a lampstand and a table. And there was the sacred loaves of bread or the showbread on that table. This room was called the holy place or the most holy of holies. Verse 3 says, then there was a, a curtain. And behind the curtain was the second room called the most holy place. And in that room, there was a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant. You could circle that and actually write in here 1 Samuel 4 if you wanted to. That would let you know where to go back to, which was covered with gold on all sides. And inside this three and a half by two and a half foot acacia box wrapped in gold was Aaron's staff. And it was a gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff, and it had sprouted leaves, his staff did, in the stone tablets of the covenant. And above the ark were the cherubim of divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we can explain these things in detail right now. They're just giving a, a running, an account, a running account of, of Israel and what has happened in the New Testament account of Hebrews. So now we know that the Ark of the Covenant was a, it was a resting place where God didn't reside, but he met with Moses on behalf of the nation of Israel. And it's this beautiful, ornate box that was to be transported by these poles and the priests. And inside this were three things, the, the two stone tablets that we see in Exodus 20 of the Ten Commandments. The one that says that I am the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God, you should have no other gods before me. And then the second one that says don't make any graven images or have idols. And the third one that says don't take the Lord's name in vain. And the fourth one that says keep the Sabbath, keep it holy, set apart. And the fifth one that says, honor your father and mother. And the sixth one that says, don't murder. And the seventh that says, don't commit adultery. And the eighth that says, don't steal. The ninth that says, don't lie. And the tenth that says, do not covet what your neighbors have. This sets the tone and the temperature that will establish the, the boundaries for relationship between God and the Israelite people. And they were kept in this beautiful box as a reminder of the presence of the Lord. And on this staff, Aaron's staff, it says that it sprouted. It sprouted these almonds signifying growth and maturity and blooming and God's supernatural power and authority. And the third thing was this gold bowl that kept manna in it. And manna literally means what is it? 
It was God's provision for the, the Israelites as they wandered the desert. It was a, a wafer. It was a flake that had honey as a taste to it. And it was representative of how God cared for and sustained the nation in their semi-nomadic wanderings. How God cared about them when none of it made sense. And he used it as, as a remnant, as a reminder of, of the person and the character and the nature and the promises of God. But the box wasn't God. The box, the box was just a representation of the place on what they called the mercy seat, where God would come between, the presence of the Lord would come between these two cherubims and would rest and there would give Moses or the priest the, the, the instruction on behalf of God to the nation of how they were to live and lead and love. So what's the problem? They said, let's, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. It's 18 miles away. We can make it in a day and we can, we can travel back the next. And if we carry it into battle, if we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. Now, I want you to pay attention. There is nothing inherently wrong with wanting to bring the Ark of the Covenant into battle. This isn't the first and it won't be the last time that you see this experience. But the question that we have to wrestle with is what's the problem? The problem is as they, as they realize that there's an issue, that they've lost this battle, well, let me, let me take you back to the, to the illustration at the beginning. Imagine the Cleveland fan base. The Cavaliers are, are down. They're losing. And as they start to lose, they all begin shouting at the coach. And the coach looks around and he, he starts asking his assistant coaches, hey, we're down. We're losing. What are we missing? What do we need? And they say, we know, we know. Go get the chalk. Throw the chalk up in the air. Yes, then victory will be ours. Forget about LeBron James. No, I mean really forget about LeBron. He's not that great. But all things considered, all things considered, without the man, LeBron James, to receive the ball with three seconds left, down by two, to either take the three to win the game or to go in for the two to tie the game or to go in for the two plus one and win the game with a the, with the foul shot. Without that man, what good is the magic? What good is the, the cloud of, 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 of chalk? It's really pointless, isn't it? Yet this is the problem. The nation of Israel is under attack. And rather than calling out for God, they call out for their religion, for their relics, for their, for their rituals. They didn't, they didn't request that the elders would go to, to Eli and to Hophni and Phinehas and to Samuel and, and on their behalf beg God to intercede for them. They said, just go, just run to Shiloh and go, go get the magic juju. They were viewing the things of God as little more than good luck. And they thought, man, if we could just, if we could just get our hands on the Ark of the Covenant, we'll be all right. And we can look at them. And we can say, how, how ludicrous does that sound? That's lunacy. We know that the power is the power of God. It's the sovereignty of God. It's the spirit of God. It's not, it's not in the process. It's in the person of God, right? Yet how many of us come to church week after week ready for our religion? Oh, stay with me now. How many of us come to church and we want that song? No, not, not that song. That song sung. And we want it sung in this key. Because that key's too high. The other key's too low. And, and, and we, man, when we struggle, we, we need a word from the Lord. So when we say word from the Lord, you know what we don't turn? We don't turn to the word of the Lord. We turn to somebody to tell us what the word of the Lord says. Man, last week I was struggling. I needed a word from the Lord and God gave me Russell. This week I'm struggling and I got, I got stuck with Andrew. <laughs> That's all right. We have a YouTube channel. You can go back and watch it on rerun. I'm okay with that. Man, I just, I just need to pick me up. If I could just, if I could just, man, I just, if I could just get to church and sit in my seat. Well, you came on the right day. Daylight savings and a lot of rain and spring break. You got your pick. Man, if I, if I, if only I could just get involved in that ministry at church, I'd feel really good. If I, if I could get a Stephen minister, if I, could, if I could be a part of upper room counseling, or maybe, maybe if I start doing some stuff for God, he'll bless me. I'm going to start helping out with youth group. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help out with children's ministry. I mean, it might be a little bit like purgatory, but I'm, I'm going to do it because I, I deserve it. I deserve it. And, 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 and that gold grill? Oh, you go grill. You know I'm putting my name. What is it? Go grill at reachchurchne.org. You, I'm, you, psh, wedding. All of a sudden, you're having bar mitzvahs. You're having bar mitzvahs. You're having quinceañeras. You're having, like, you're, you're celebrating everything. Celebrating Valentine's Day and St. Patrick's Day. You're not even Irish. Stop it. We run to the things. To the religious relics. And we lose sight of the right relationship. This isn't unique to us. And do you know how it happens? Come on, lean in. I'm going to give you this today for free. Complacency. Complacency. Satan will literally use your comfortability to keep you from following your convictions of Christ. I'm doing pretty good right now. I don't, I don't need to be at church. You don't have to, I have to go to church. I can, I, I, I can get church anywhere. I can literally search the world over and have the best communicators at my fingertips. I don't need to be at church. You're right. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. No, but the Bible says that if you want to honor God in all things, that you come to the body. Don't give up meeting this somewhere in the habit of doing. So you don't, it's not a prerequisite to be a Christian to go to church, but coming together as a collective body is a byproduct of your salvation. But we get comfortable. Well, I like attending church at home in my pajamas. And if you guys would love me to come in my pajamas and serve me bacon and eggs like my wife does when you're preaching, I might consider it. Well, we got the gold grill. We might maybe give some consideration to it. How many of us, how many of us, if we're really honest, we start to lose sight of God when things are going good. And then when we start to experience struggle, we don't run to God. The enemy actually has us fooled. We think we're running to God, but we're actually running to the religious relics and not the relationship. That song can't save you. As amazing as our band is, they can't save you. No matter how gifted any of our communicators are here, uh, on here, we can't save you. That seat can't save you. None of the ministries of this church can save you. Everything Reach Church does is a byproduct of a community where people encounter Jesus. And their lives are changed forever. So everything we do is a byproduct of that transformation. The Israelites have become complacent. And they say, we're struggling. Go, 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 go. Yeah, everybody's leaning in. Yeah, here we go. Yep, go to Shiloh. Yeah, go to the tabernacle. Yeah, we're going to get. Oh, we're going to get the box. Okay. All right, cool. Verse 4. So the elders sent men to Shiloh to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were also there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, their shout of joy was so loud, it made the ground shake. Come on, you want to talk about a worship experience? Woo! They were so excited at the sight of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord that they all collectively, they all made such a noise. This is a physiological thing. It actually happens that the ground started to shake underneath them. Amazing. What's the problem? Go back to verse 1. Here's the problem. Verse 1 says, and Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. What were Samuel's words? What Eli said, tell me everything, don't spare me. What were the words that God gave Samuel? Hophni and Phinehas, scoundrels, scums, they're going to die. Oh, and by the way, so are you. And it says that Samuel's words went out to who? To the whole nation of Israel. So the Israelites actually knew the kind of scoundrels and scumbags Hophni and Phinehas were. It wasn't a surprise to them. These mugs were taking advantage of women in the tabernacle. They were seducing women in the church. They were stealing the offering straight out of the tabernacle. Three-pronged fork. Well, but that's for God. No, 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 no. God's got plenty. This is mine. That's mine too. And if you don't do it right now, I'll just, I'll just come take it myself. And Eli? Eli wasn't exempt. No, he wasn't seducing women like, like his sons were. And he wasn't stealing like his sons were. 
But the man of God came to Eli and said, you know what your, what your sons are doing. They're wicked. And what did Eli do? A sin of omission. What is omission? Not doing what you're called to do. So everybody in Israel knows what's going on. But here's the deal. They're so desperate. They are so desperate because of the loss at battle that they're willing to overlook the obvious recklessness going on. They know Hophni and Phinehas have no business leading them or carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And it doesn't say that they sat back and said, oh, shoot. What? Mm, guys, come on. Did you remember what Samuel said about Hophni and Phinehas? Are going to, what are they doing carrying the Ark of the Covenant? We need to be really careful and aware. We need to be intentional about who's leading us. Remember, the speed of the lead, the, the speed of the leader is the speed of the pack. We've got to be really intentional about who's leading us, where they're leading us. Consider where they've led from, where they're leading out of. Are they leading out of a healthy place or are they leading out of an unhealthy place? Are pastors that are leading you just going through the motions or are they following the leadership of the Holy Spirit? They're willing, the Israelite nation is willing to look straight past that. Who's leading them because they're so desperate. The enemy uses this in our lives. There are so many false teachers that are wrongly dividing, not even dividing, they are wrongly presenting the word of God in ways that tickles people's ears that are leading to death and destruction. And we are so caught up in our brokenness that we're willing to overlook it because they sound really good. Blessing, amen. Money, hallelujah. Healing, yes. A hot girlfriend, come on. Pastor, why don't you preach like that? Blessing, yes. But the blessing is in the person of Christ in you. And the byproduct is whether you have everything or nothing, that you know you can do everything through Christ who gives you strength. That's the promise. That's the promise. But we get so consumed with poor theology, study of God, and doctrine, that we, we're willing to look past all the obvious because it makes us feel good, this feel-good theology. It's not unique to us. The Israelites struggle with it. Israelites, Hophni and Phinehas, here they come. Ark of the Covenant, they shout for joy. Verse 6, what's going on? The Philistines asked, two miles away. Two miles away they hear this ruckus. What's going on? The Philistines asked. What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because the Ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. The gods have come into their camp. They cried. This is a disaster. We, we, we've never had to face anything like this before. Help! Who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? Now, there's some truths to what these Philistines believe about God. Mighty? Absolutely. Historically, they're well aware that this is the gods that delivered the Israelites out of captivity from Egypt. They're aware of that. That's a powerful God. This is a God who, who brought plagues as a demonstration of his authority and his power. That's a powerful God. The problem is they are looking at it through their own lenses. Rather than identifying Yahweh, rather than identifying I am that I am, ego a me, Rather than identifying this comes from one singular monotheistic God of the universe, creator, author, perfecter, and finisher of our faith, they look at it through the lens of their lives. The Philistines were polytheistic. They had a God for everything. And if they didn't have one, they would create one. They had Asherah poles. They would carve out graven images in rock and stone. They would melt down fine metals, and they would make these beautiful, ornate gods, little G deities to worship. And you don't have a god over there, but you, and they could call on these gods for different reasons at different times, and you could even mix and match them, and all kinds of things were going on. And so they look at Yahweh through the, the lens of their secularism, and it influences. There's some truth to what they're saying, isn't there? It was God who delivered the Israelites from the Egyptians. It is God who is sovereign. It was God who brought, who brought these 10 plagues as a demonstration of his power. There's nothing wrong with that truth. The problem is it's a distorted truth because they're looking at it from their own lenses we need to be careful not to interpret the word of God from our own lenses our teaching team here we are so blessed with the amazing communicators God's given us 
But we have a term that we use. It's a Latin term, sola scriptura, which literally means let the word of God do the work of God so that we can be in the will of God. We allow the text to inform us and to transform us. We allow the text to interpret the text. Sola scriptura. Because if we don't, then what we do is we end up parsing out the scripture and compartmentalizing it. And we make it say things that it was never intended to say. I've said this before. I just want to show you how easy it is. And it's an amazing passage of scripture. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I need that. I need that hope. I need that future. And I rest in that promise. I'm sorry, are you under complete slavery and captivity to the Babylonians right now? Have you been exiled from your home, driven from everything you know, lost your, I mean, literally your house is burnt down, the place of worship completely shambled, the, the, the rock wall that separated, torn in half, losing family and friends and jobs, and now you're forced to live in a foreign land as a complete captive? No. Because that promise is, it's descriptive. For the nation of Israel, who is literally living under everything I just said. So we've got to be careful. What it does do, it may not be a promise for us, but it reveals the nature of God and his character in us. We know that our God is a good God. And we can look at that and say, we know that God provides and that God restores. In fact, that's, that's the meta narrative of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. If anybody ever asks you this question, what's the Bible about? The Bible is about restoration from Genesis chapter 3 to Revelation 26. The meta narrative of scripture is restoration. That is just another promise of God for restoration. And so we have got to use sola scriptura, let the word of God do the work of God so that we can abide in the will of God. Let's stop looking and parsing scriptures and compartmentalizing it and making it say something it doesn't say because then you live a very, very, very dangerous type of faith. You're leaning on your religious rituals rather than a right relationship. Now, I want to just be really honest. I spent much of my early years in ministry preaching a false gospel. No fault of my own. I mean, I'm, I'm culpable. I was the one with the Bible, and I was the one with the, with the Bible in front of me, but I didn't know any better. I didn't have anybody raising me up, teaching me how to rightly divide the word of God. Understanding how culture and context informs understanding and application. I didn't understand the significance of the weight that a teacher carries. Not many of you should presume to be teachers because you will be judged, and much more so. I'm going to have to stand before the Bema City Judgment and answer, give an account for what I did with the opportunities that God gave me. But so will you with the opportunities to learn, receive, and live the Word of God. So when we say sola scriptura, let the Word of God do the work of God so that we can abide in the will of God, we mean it. Because apart from this, we can do nothing. Literally nothing. Verse 8. Help, they cried. Who can save us from the mighty gods of Israel? They're the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Verse 9. Fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, we will become the Hebrew slaves just as they have been ours. Stand up like men and fight. Do you know what the... What the issue is here, they've identified the sovereignty of God, but they're not afraid of God. The Israelites, the Israelites have given them no reason to be. If I found out the presence of the Lord was somewhere, do you think I'm going to tell everybody around me, guys, get up, stand up, and fight like men? No, because their representation was soft. They weren't afraid of God. They were afraid of the historical narrative of God, but they weren't afraid of the God in front of them because the Israelites were not abiding in God. Therefore, the presence of God wasn't with them. Do you see what I'm saying? We've got to abide in the will of God. That's where the power comes from. Verse 10, so the Philistines fought desperately and Israel was defeated. The slaughter was great. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. The survivors turned and they fled to their tents. The Ark of the Covenant of God was captured. And Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were killed. And you say, Pastor, how can that be? Well, remember I said early on that this was a conditional covenant? That the Israelites and Moses mutually, collectively, and intentionally entered into an agreement with God. 
I want you to take your thumb and, and keep it in First Samuel, but I want you to turn to the left, and I want you to go to Leviticus chapter 26. If you start at the beginning of your Bible, it's Genesis, Exodus, and then Leviticus. If you hit Numbers or Deuteronomy, you've gone too far. I want you to head back to Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus 26, and I'm going to read to you a little bit more than I did last service. 11 o'clock, I always say it, and I always mean it. You guys always get more. You're welcome. And get that go girl. We're going to start serving lunch so y'all can stay even longer. <laughs> Why is the grill in the sanctuary? Don't worry about it. <laughs> Pastor's preaching. Start with me in verse 14. Leviticus 26, 14. However, the terms of this covenant, if you do not listen to me or obey all these commands, and if, and if you break my covenant, my mutual agreement, by rejecting my decrees, there's culpability treating my regulations with contempt and refusing to obey my commands. I will punish you. I will bring a sudden terrors upon you, wasting diseases and burning fevers that will cause your eyes to fail and your life to ebb away. You will plant crops in vain because your enemies will eat them. I'll turn against you and, and you'll be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you and you will run even when no one is chasing you. Friends, I want us to understand something. God has taken out all of the guesswork of what happens when we live in religion and not a right relationship. That God turns us over to ourselves, to our own destruction and to our own sin. And I think too many of us run to the church and we cling to the religion and not the right relationship. And if you don't believe me, Thousands of years removed from this historical narrative that we're reading in 1 Samuel is a, is a parable that Jesus gives in his teaching. He said, many are going to come to me. And you're going to say, you're going to say, hey, Lord. And he's going to say, I, I don't know you. Depart from me. And you're going to look at me and you're going to say, Lord, what do, you, what do you mean we don't know you? Of course we know you. We, we went to church and we sang those worship songs. We dressed up in Sunday's best for you, Lord. We, 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 gave, we gave some money. We volunteered at church and we, we even read our Bibles one, once in a while. We even said some of those prayers. Lord, we, we were good. We were, we, we were moral. We were upstanding and right. What do you mean we didn't know you? And Jesus says, where were you when I was hungry and thirsty and naked and, 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 and in the hospital sick and in prison? And they look they look with absolute shock on their faces. Jesus said, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or, or naked or in the hospital sick or in prison? And Jesus says, you say you love me. You've done all of these religious things. But to truly love me is to obey my commands. Love the Lord your God with every fiber of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. Whatever you've done to the least of these, it's though you've done it to me. Right now, the band's going to come out. And Terrence and Rachel and Rob, Caden and Jessica and Brian and Austin, they're going to pick up their instruments and their microphones. And they're going to lead us in a song of celebration. But before they do, I want us to consider a different approach to this question. Why did the Lord allow us to lose this battle? And rather than trying to solve a problem, how about we, we take on the same attitude of David who in Psalm 51 says, Lord, search my heart, test me, try me, evaluate me. See if there's any wickedness in me and then lead me. Because friends, I, I want to tell you the truth. As much as we love to sing praises to our God, it can all too often become about what we think of the song. Do we like the tempo? Is it a good beat? Does it have that good driving bass that you can feel in your chest? Is it too much bass that makes your head hurt? 
Is a pastor going to preach a message that entertains me? I've said this before. I'm not joking. I truly, I, I, when I, when I, whenever I teach hermeneutics, which is how to present the, the Word of God, I, I literally think of this all the time. Ask my staff. We, we wrestle with this idea. I, I feel like gladiator. Are you not entertained? That's a real struggle. So even in my heart, I have to say, Lord, test me and try me. When I go up to preach today, God, I don't want to do it for the applause of man. I want to do it out of sacrificial obedience to who you've called me to be and what you've called me to do. And just so you know, the day that I stop praying that prayer is the day that you stop following me. Because it means I've lost sight of what matters most, who matters most. So we're going to sing a song. And the words are going to come up on the screen, and I want to encourage you to do something different. I want to encourage you right now to ask God, in the same way David did, to search your heart. And stop running to the religious rituals. Because no song is going to save you. No pastor is going to save you. No ministry of the church is going to save you. No go grill is going to save you. It might save your graduation party, but it's not going to save you for eternity. This right here, just a bunch of hype. Just a bunch of smoke and mirrors. If, if it's not a byproduct of our great God. I want to read this historical psalm to you in closing. Psalm 78, Asaph, verse 52. A historical poem accompanied by music to celebrate the person and the priority of God, even when you've lost your way. Psalm 78, beginning in verse 50, 52. But he, God, led his own people like a flock of sheep, guiding them safely through the wilderness. He kept them safe so they were not afraid. And the sea covered their enemies. He, he brought them to the border of his holy land, to this land of hills he had won for them. He had won for them. He had won for them. He drove out the nations before them, and he gave them their inheritance by lot. He settled the tribes of Israel into their homes, but they kept testing and rebelling against God Most High. They did not obey his laws. They turned back and were as faithless as their parents. They were as undependable as crooked bow. They angered God by building shrines to other gods, and they made him jealous with their idols. And when God heard them, he was very angry, and he completely rejected Israel. Then he abandoned his dwelling at Shiloh, the tabernacle where he had lived among the people, and he allowed the ark of his might to be captured. He surrendered his glory into enemy hands, and he gave his people over to be butchered by the sword because he was so angry with his own people his special possession because they were just going through the motions and they had contempt they had contempt for God and so let's talk about this religious ritual and what God truly desires of us and I leave you with this Psalm 51 verse 12 Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Not sing to you, not give to you, not go to church, not do enough. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that none of us can do enough and take credit for it. So then what does God require of us? Obedience, not good luck, God then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O oh God, who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. We sing out of our salvation, not for our salvation. Verse 16, you do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You don't want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. If you have been guilty like I have of running to religious rituals in place of a right relationship with God, the only thing we can do, not the best thing, 
the only thing we can do is repent. To acknowledge it before God, to call it what it is, to say I'm sorry, and to turn from it, and to turn your eyes to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith.